Today we're going to be studying verses 13 through 16. The, the title of today's sermon is Salt and Light. So let's go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 5. And uh, even though we're going to be studying verses 13 through 16, let's go ahead and start with verse 11. Verse 11. So, and I know that puts like two apparently different sections together, uh, but I'm assuming that Jesus talks like a normal person. So in other words, like there was a logical thought flow to his ideas. Um, they're very connected. Um, so this isn't like an essay he wrote. This isn't, you know, uh, like a, a, a ser- this isn't like a, a book that he wrote. It's a sermon that he preached. So he was talking and I'm assuming that was fairly normal, right? So uh, he probably didn't sound like a news anchor. You know, like they sound so goofy sometimes because they'll be like, you know, and the chief of police said this was the worst mass murder he's seen in decades. In other news, snow on the forefront, so cuddle alert because we'll be staying inside a few days. It's like a total shift in direction. Well, I'm not convinced that Jesus did that like all of the time. In fact, more often than not, I think the more that we read scripture, the more we realize it's, it's connected especially with this sermon, I think that it's connected. I'm not saying that we assign like hidden meanings and stuff that isn't there. I'm just saying that maybe we should step back and let's take a look at the content and what Jesus was saying and try to hear it through the lens of a first century Jew, right? So let's read now from Matthew chapter five, starting with verse 11. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Heavenly Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this word. Oh, Lord, Jesus, your words are so heavy. They're so filled with meaning and so filled with life. There's so much gravitas here. When we read what you say, we know that we could explore it for eternity. I just pray, God, that today that you would just give us enough to be our daily bread so we can take the next step we need to take. So I just pray a blessing over everyone here. I pray a blessing over everyone watching online and ask God that you would just show us how to be like you and and live uh, like salt and light in a dark world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. When we're persecuted for our faith, we're told that we should rejoice and be glad because we are blessed. Now that is a big request. That is a big ask. That's an incredible command. When you get beat, uh, you know, be happy about it, would you? It's crazy, right? It sounds crazy. In Acts chapter five, the apostles were healing so many people that the religious leaders got jealous and they put them in prison. And uh, they weren't just yelled at or slapped around a little bit. They were flogged. So if you don't know what that means, it means basically that the skin was stripped off of their backs. It was a horrific thing. People often died from that kind of torture. And yet when they were persecuted in in, in this way, they rejoiced. Why? Acts 5.41 says they were rejoicing because they were counted worthy to be treated shamefully on behalf of the name of Jesus. So this is the nature of the impossible that causes people to say, wait, they did, they did what? And they were thankful about it? They were jumping up and down with joy? That, like, that's not crazy. That's supernatural. That's something other. So it's one thing to endure persecution because you're commanded to. It's another thing entirely to be happy about it and to rejoice in it, right? So once again, the Beatitudes are not a to-do list. The Beatitudes are a self-portrait of Jesus and a portrait of who we have become and who we are becoming. So notice how, how much of this is centered around the words you are. 
So it's not framed in do statements, it's framed in our statements. So this is identity. He says, you are blessed when, you're, when you are a mourner or merciful or hungry. These are the characteristics of who you are. Not just things to do, but who you are. And that's important because it shows us that being persecuted and responding with joy comes with our identity as Christians. It's because of identity that we are blessed. And it's because of identity that we will respond with joy when we're persecuted. But joy isn't the only response that should come from persecution. And that's what verses 13 through 16 are all about. Our response to persecution isn't just about joy. It's also about responding with good works to those around us. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. He explains a little bit about what that means. But we should notice his final thought in verse 16. He says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So this isn't just a, like, you know, you're a Christian and you're going to do the right thing and, you know, and people will hate you for it. No, it, it's like maybe that's the initial response. But as you push through when you're persecuted and when, and when you struggle and when you suffer, you push through, you respond with love and with kindness, and that causes the world around us to turn to God and to glorify God. And that's the backdrop for this passage. No matter what happens, we must be salt and light because it's who we are, right? So let's investigate a little more about what it means to be salt and light. We'll start by rereading verse 13. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So if we're going to understand what Jesus means when he says you know, that we are salt, we have to, again, we have to think about it from the perspective of a first century Jew. So like, for example, table salt is extremely common nowadays. Um, it's extremely cheap, extremely easy to get. Uh, you just go to Walmart and you walk around for a while until... An employee comes to you to help you find where the salt is. At least that's what the men do. I don't know if, I don't know if that's it. Right, men, you know what I'm talking about. Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about, men. Come on. I, I heard uh, this guy say, I changed my GPS to a male voice, and now it just keeps saying, keep driving, it's around here somewhere. <laughs> anyway, salt is easy for us to get. But it wasn't so easy for the ancient Jews and for uh, the Romans, for example. And so because of this, salt was highly valued as a, as a main commodity. Entire empires rose and fell because of salt. So in other words, salt is valuable. The Roman government started producing salt about 600 years before Jesus was born. They used salt as a way to foster economic uh, growth. Uh, they even used salt as a currency. So uh, Roman soldiers were partially paid in salt. The, the, that word for Latin for salt is, is sal, which is where we get our word salary. If a Roman soldier was a lousy soldier, they would say that he wasn't worth his salt. That's where that comes from. Meaning that he was not deserving of his pay. Well, the Jews certainly would have understood all this. And so when Jesus said to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth, they would have initially heard, you are the most valuable people. You are treasured. You are important. You have value. Jesus just finished telling us in the Beatitudes that the poor in spirit will inherit the kingdom of heaven. The humble will inherit the earth. So these are the promised blessings for the true citizens of his kingdom. Do you realize that you are destined to have ownership in heaven and earth? Why? Not because we bought it, but because Jesus bought it with his blood and then he gave it to us as an inheritance. Amen? Amen. And yet heaven and earth aren't even the most valuable things to the Lord. You are. You are valuable. I am valuable to him as his son. If the price that Jesus paid to redeem you was, it had to be the precious blood of God, then how valuable must we be to the Lord if that was the price that it took? We are not worthless to God. No matter how much we failed, we are valuable. Jesus loves you. He died for you and he sees you as a valuable commodity in his kingdom. And because you're a valuable commodity in his kingdom, God wants you to function like a valuable commodity in his kingdom. And that's the other thing that Jesus is saying. Yes, you're valuable, but you also need to be 
useful. This paper is not working with me. Okay. Salt is useful. So one of the reasons why Roman soldiers were paid in salt, at least partially, is because it ensured that they could preserve their food rations when they were on really long marches and campaigns. Salt is an incredible preservative. And in a world without refrigerators, that was extremely useful to them. They needed to preserve their food so that it wouldn't decay. And so like they would put salt, like if they, if they had food and they prepared some of it, there was some left over, they would put salt on it so that it wouldn't decay. All that, all that salt would kill all the surface bacteria. And so that was probably like the predominant use of salt 2,000 years ago. Now here's the incredible application for us today. Salt, sodium chloride, does not decay. It's an extremely stable compound. And Jesus calls us salt. See, once you get saved, you become salt. You don't decay. You're made new. That's what we just celebrated, right? Everybody going under the water that was death to their old life. And then coming out of the water, they're made new. So through the new covenant, we've been given a new life. We've been given a new spirit, a new heart, and a new mind. We are the righteousness of Christ and therefore God's ambassadors to the world. Why? Because we don't decay. So that's why we have a responsibility to the world, which does decay. The world tends to greater and greater evil. And we are, are preservatives in this world holding back death and dysfunction. It is our responsibility, y'all, to counter that moral decay in the world around us. We slow it down and we even reverse it as we lead people to Christ and then they are made new and then they become agents of preservation, keeping the world from falling into greater and greater and greater and greater evil and being destroyed by their own evil and the wrath of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Woo. Think about it this way. Why was the world destroyed in a flood? Because there was no preserving agent to keep the world from putrefaction. So there was no Christians at that time. There weren't even any Jews at that time. Why was Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed? Because there was no one good left in the city. Like except for Abraham's nephew Lot, everyone in the city was extremely wicked and deserved to die. But Abraham, who didn't even live in Sodom and Gomorrah, interceded on their behalf and almost, he almost saved them from destruction. He prayed and he asked God to save them if there were just 50 righteous people in the city. And God was like, all right, so for 50 righteous people, I won't destroy it. And then Abraham literally starts bartering with God and he's like, okay, well, you agreed to 50. Would you agree to 45? And God's like, I would agree to 45. He's like, how about 40? How about 30? He goes down to 20. He goes down to 10. And uh, like, this is some sort of auction. And God agreed to every single request. But there wasn't even 10 good people in the entire city. And so God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah anyway. It was still destroyed. But the point is that Abraham was asking God to spare the city for the sake of the righteous, on behalf of the righteous, but there were none righteous. Whether because they'd all been murdered or because they'd all fled, there was no group of righteous people in the city. If there had been, then maybe they could have pre prevented the extreme moral decay of the city and saved it from destruction. That's our job. Our job is to be the salt of the earth and to prevent in God's power with his help the decline of the morals and ethics around us. Amen? Amen. And salt is not just a preservative. It also brings uh, flavor. It creates thirst. It brings nourishment. It has a thousand uses. It is useful. So Jesus is saying that we are useful. And that's the question that I need the Holy Spirit to answer for me. Am I being useful in his kingdom, right? Holy Spirit, am I being useful for your purposes and your kingdom plans? Am I being the salt of the earth to the people around me? Am I still salty? Or have I lost my saltiness? Jesus said, if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will it be made salty again? But if salt is a very stable compound, how does salt lose its saltiness, right? So has anyone ever reached for a salt shaker 
to put salt on your steak and you start pouring it out and then you take a bite of your steak and it doesn't taste salty. The salt expired. The salt no longer works anymore. It, it turned to sugar. Something else random, right? It looks good. Still looks shiny and bright and crystalline in nature, but it doesn't work. Has that ever happened? Of course that's never happened. Why? Because salt is stable. So it doesn't break down like that. That's just not what's the way salt works. So then the only way that salt could lose its saltiness is if you add other things to the salt in the salt shaker. And it probably doesn't happen by accident. It has to be contaminated by the addition of foreign substances like dirt and sand and clay. It loses its effectiveness when it becomes impure. So if you've been contaminated by sin and diluted by immorality of all kinds in your life, then you have lost your saltiness and you need to be made salty again. And the way that that happens is repentance. Repentance is the catalyst that is needed to become salty again. And by the way, I, I'm not so sure that saltiness and holiness, or I should say righteousness maybe, are the same thing. Like, so in other words, you're still righteous in Christ when you mess up in sin, so, like that's who you are, but you lose your effectiveness as a witness to those around you. So it'd be like if I, if I decided tonight that I was going to go and I was just going to go get trashed at a bar because life is hard and so ministry is hard. So I go to the bar tonight and I get totally wasted and then I start witnessing to the drunk guy next to me. It doesn't work, right? I, I've lost my salt. Maybe I haven't lost my salvation, but I've lost my saltiness. And repentance and obedience will bring saltiness back into my life. So if that's you this morning, then I would encourage you to take some time to repent today. Come and take some time to pray with the prayer teams afterward. Come and lay your idols and your sins and your strongholds and any distractions in your life down at the altar and then don't pick them back up. Leave this place free and salty. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. So that's, so that's salt. Now let's talk about light. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. To say that we are the light of the world is astounding. Because Jesus himself is the light of the world. Jesus said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. And once again, we aren't talking about doing anything. We're talking about being. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. So it's an identity statement. And he's bringing us into his identity. And now he says, you are the light of the world. So you see, God is united with whatever belongs to him. I had like this whole section on this. I did this exploration of uh, how God unites himself with his creation in scripture, but it was too long, so I took it out. But you can research it yourself. The Father is one with Jesus, and Jesus is one with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is one with the Father, and the Father is one with his creation. Anything that belongs to him, he's one with. He's one with the angels. He's one with his children. He's one with the church. He unites himself to whatever belongs to him. So because Jesus is the light of the world, we are also. And what does that imply? Well, for one thing, light is no pushover. Darkness is, right? So like darkness doesn't push light back, but light does push darkness back. If you are light, then it is literally impossible for you to lose to darkness. It simply cannot happen. And what this tells me is that we have authority to push back the darkness around us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Based on who we are, like based on my identity, God has given you authority over the darkness that creeps around you in your life. You have authority. But only if you choose to walk in that authority. We are called in scripture to walk in the light. And that's why Jesus said, don't hide your light under a basket. He doesn't say, don't let your light go out. He says, don't cover it. Don't hide it. Why? Because it's who you are. 
Don't deny who you are. 1 Peter 2, 9. You are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are a people for his possession so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is a challenge to live godly lives before the Lord. Being the light of the world means that we're walking in honesty and purity and freedom. And as Ephesians 5 says, we're walking in goodness and righteousness and in truth. Which is probably the best synonym for light is truth. Ephesians 5, 6 through 13, let no one deceive you with empty arguments for God's wrath is coming on the disobedient because of these things. Therefore, do not become their partners for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth, testing what is pleasing to the Lord. Don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what is done by them in secret. Everything exposed by the light is made visible for what makes everything visible is light. Therefore, it is said, get up, sleeper, and rise up from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now, notice that it doesn't say that you are in the light, and he didn't say that you used to be in the darkness. He didn't say it. He says it in other places as a matter of metaphor, but right now he says, you are light, and the world is darkness. That's a massive difference. Once again, this is identity. If you are a citizen in God's kingdom, then this is who you are. You are the light of the world. It's impossible to be darkness. So then don't do the things that the darkness does. Don't try to align yourself with the works of darkness as God defines it. We aren't participating in the fruitful works of darkness anymore. We only participate in the fruitful works of light. So if your coworker comes to you and starts telling you a disgusting joke, then don't laugh and do a small chuckle uncomfortably. Say, that's disgusting. That's degrading. When someone invites you over for a party, be who God says you are. Don't conform to whatever the world is. Be conformed in your mind to the light of the world, Jesus Christ, because it's who you are. So, amen. So to sum all this up, Jesus wants us to be the, the salt of the earth and the, and the light of the world. He wants us to respond with good deeds when we face persecution or when we face impossible situations. He wants us to be the salt of the earth, not contaminated by the sin of the world. He wants us to be the light of the world, not hiding our God-given morals and convictions under a basket. He wants to live out the great commission in front of the world not watering the truth of the gospel. Remember, we're salt, not sugar. It's not always sweet to hear truth. The church cannot be silent about some of these decaying issues of sexual immorality and broken identity and false religion and false gospels and blatant deceptions and lies and strongholds that are tearing people apart in the world. If that sounds like I'm saying that we need to get out there with a bullhorn and a bulldozer and tell people they're going to hell, well, I'm certainly not. It's not my job to condemn people, and I'm not talking about being hateful, but I'm talking about being truthful. And it's my job to be a preservative, and functionally, practically, how can I help to preserve someone else's life if I don't tell them the truth of the gospel? And the truth of the gospel is that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the preserving agent, the gospel of Jesus Christ, amen? So I don't have salt in myself without Christ. I don't have light in myself without Christ. The moon isn't the source of light. It just reflects the light. And that's you and I. And the job of being salt and light requires us to renounce the sin of the world, to proclaim the righteousness of God and the lordship of Jesus Christ, and to point people to the cross. 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 6. Therefore, since we have this ministry, because we were shown mercy, we do not give up. Instead, we have renounced secret and shameful things, not acting deceitfully or distorting the word of God, but commending ourselves before God to everyone's conscience by an open display, open display of the truth. But if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we are not proclaiming ourselves, 
but Jesus Christ is Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. It's who you are. But you have to choose to be this to the people around you. You can't hide what you believe because you're afraid of being persecuted. You've got a job to do. We can't just have our secret little Christian meetings and our secret little church club and not share the gospel. It must be shared. It must be used. Or like manna, it becomes distorted. To not share the gospel is to distort the gospel. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So live your Christian values out in front of the world. Die in front of the world, just like Jesus. Let them see your good works. Let them see your mercy and your piety and your integrity and your victory and your love. This isn't about legalism. It's not about being judgmental or cruel or confrontational. This is about the love of God. As, as John Stott said, salt and light have one thing in common. They give and they expend themselves and thus are the opposite of any and every kind of self-centered religiosity. Salt and light give and expend themselves it's the nature and the function of what Jesus is calling us to do if we're going to be like him. Because again, if this is all about identity, then this is who Jesus is. He was a man who came and he fully gave himself. He fully expended himself for the sake of the world. And to sacrificially give and expend yourself so that you can meet someone else's great need is the very definition of love to respond with joy in the midst of persecution, to offer kindness to your worst enemy, to worship the Lord when you're hurting and overwhelmed and isolated and abandoned by those around you, to strive to be like Christ in every situation in your life. This is what it means to be salt and light. No matter what we're going through, we still have a good flavor. We still have a bright countenance about us that is bright. You can tell when someone is a brother or a sister in Christ because their hope is in the Lord. And they have joy in their life, even in the midst of suffering. We respond differently to suffering than the world does, maybe even with joy, because we know that God has a purpose in the pain, that he's taking the test and he's turning it into a testimony. <clears throat> you know, throughout this fast, We've all been getting attacked. We've got one more week, y'all. Hold on. Hold on tight. Keisha and I have been praying for a lot of you throughout this fast. Our staff is praying for you. Our church is praying for you. We're praying for each other. We've heard some really heartbreaking stories uh, of things that have happened, really tough situations, very difficult spiritual attacks. So I just want to know that we're with you. More than that, I want you to know that there are real opportunities to be the salt and the light right now through all the difficult things that are happening. And yes, make no mistake, the enemy is making weapons against you. And it's probably not gonna be what you think because he's really smart. So he'll take things that are, they look like good things in your life. They look like beautiful things in your life and he'll use it against you. He'll turn it into a weapon against you so that you'll never look in that place. For me, <laughs> being very vulnerable right now, Satan tries to, he tries to turn my sermons into a weapon against me. He tries to use my sermons as an agent of uh, an ego building or something for me. As if I could take the glory of God away from him. He tries to take my sermons and turn it into a weapon so that I spend too much time on my sermon and not with my family or not with my staff. And if I'm not careful, I won't see it because the sermon is a great thing, right? And I'm doing God's will. Satan wants to turn it into a weapon against me in my life. And the things that you think Satan has no right to touch because they're beautiful things the Lord wants to use in your life or a gift from the Lord to you, Satan will take those things and he will deceptively turn them into a weapon against you in your life. So you got to be watching. 
this. He's fashioning weapons against you in your life. There are swords that are being made against you, uniquely made for you, against you in your life right now. But you have to know that what the enemy means for evil, the Lord means for good. And the swords being made against you will refine you, amen? The enemy knows that the attacks of, the sword, of, of his swords that he's making against you are a risk because there's a chance that iron will sharpen iron. He knows that there's a very real chance that when he attacks you that you'll turn to the Lord and then his attacks will just to turn you into a sharper weapon, a stronger weapon, a tested weapon, an experienced weapon. And because the enemy is smart, if his weapons start to refine you and make you stronger, he's going to stop attacking you. He's not going to knowingly participate with God in your sanctification. So he'll quit attacking because fighting the battle makes him lose the battle. Remember that the Lord turned the curses of Balaam into blessings. And this is how we win the spiritual battles against the enemy in our life. When Satan attacks, we turn to the Lord and the Lord will use temptation and trial and struggle and suffering and whatever it is to sanctify us. And Satan, disgusted by holiness, will flee in defeat, find something else to do. So I'm going to encourage you, I'm going to exhort you, I'm going to challenge you with the question this morning, and it, it is a hard question. This is a hard question. But it's at the crux of the Christian life. We can't ignore this question, guys. The reason why people fall away from the faith is because they can't or won't answer this question correctly. And if we answer this question properly, then we will be equipped to persevere as salt and light in the world. And here's the question. What is God allowed to do? What is God allowed to do in my life? What is he allowed to take from me in my life? See, we need to have a very clear understanding that the Lord is allowed to take anything he wants. He doesn't owe me anything and I don't own anything. So he can take all my money or any possession that he wants. And Jesus set the example for us. He was homeless. He can take all my health and even my life if he wants to. He can have me tortured and he can have me martyred and murdered. Jesus was crucified. He can take my family, he can take my children, and he can ask me to give them up because they belong to him anyway. And God the Father gave up his own son, his only child, which he also expected of Abraham and Hannah and you and I. What is God allowed to do and how much do I trust him? 1 Peter 2.23 says, When Jesus was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges rightly, justly. If I'm truly going to be conformed into the image of Christ, then I have to be willing to suffer the things that he suffered. Philippians 3.10. See, we can't just be conformed to the identity of his blessing. We have to be conformed to the identity of his suffering. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. 1 Peter 4, 1 through 2. Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same understanding because the one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin. So what is God allowed to do and how much will I trust him? Because the victory will come. It is promised to you. But you got to go through the temptation and the suffering and the cross and then it will come. So keep trusting. Keep believing God's promises. Keep moving forward with that predicament or with that persecution or with that struggle or with that, or with that situation, whatever it is, and know that you are the salt of the earth, that you are the light of the world. So that, that's the job description right there. So take up the job that comes with this identity. Take up the responsibility. Ask God to do impossible things through you and let others see your good works. Turn to the Lord and glorify your Father in heaven. Not me, not glorify me, not glorify you, not glorify us. We're not doing the good works for our glory. 
but so that people can turn and give glory to God. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? Uh, prayer teams are going to be coming down up to the front in just a moment. Uh, if you have a prayer need, I would encourage you guys to come down to the front. Jesus said, if any two agree on any matter they pray for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. So uh, we've seen a lot of prayer requests answered down here at the front at this altar. Amen? So I encourage you guys to do that. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, for this word. Uh, God, you have not just commanded us to be the salt and the light. You've told us that we are the salt and the light. God, identity is the most powerful form of transformation. And here we are with an opportunity to really receive the identity that you've put upon us. It's a beautiful identity. It's a wonderful identity filled with blessings and filled with, with all kinds of, of bene spiritual benefits and victories. And we thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you for calling us royalty. Thank you for treating us as sons and daughters. Thank you for the inheritance that waits for us in heaven. Thank you for your good to us now and your goodness to us now and forever. God, I just pray for a special anointing, God, to move uh, forward in our lives, to move out of these doors and to go back into our circles of our spheres of, of life and of influence. Help us to move into this identity and to function and operate in this identity, God. That we would be that we would be useful to you in your kingdom work. That we would align ourselves with the fruit of the light. That we would truly be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. An impossible thing to ask. But with you, all things are possible. We surrender ourselves to you. We rejoice. We pick up gladness because of who we are in you. Help us to rejoice in the identity. Help us to rejoice in this job description. Make us fruitful, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. If you're in the Alamogordo area, we would love for you to join us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11. Visit us at ChristCommunityAlamo.org or download our app from the App Store where you can find more information about Christ Community, share a prayer need, or even give to this ministry. God bless you and thank you for being a part of Christ Community Church, where it's about relationship and not religion.